I, I have an introduction slide. So I'm Jonathan Deutsch, if anyone uh, missed that at the beginning. Um, I am the founder and a developer of Hype. Um, it's really great to see everyone today and have everyone here. Um, I've really enjoyed the talks. I hope all of you have as well. Um, I'm just kind of curious because some of you I've talked with, but some of you I haven't had the chance to talk with. Um, so looking at the kind of evolution of Hype, I would just love to see a raise of hands on who started on kind of which version. So the first icon is the original app icon before we had an app icon. I think there's only one hand that's going to go up on that one. Uh, the second app icon was in a beta state, so there was a limited seat of like original graphic developers. There was like 300 people, so I was wondering if anyone was here from like the original pre-1.0 beta. Kathy. Um, okay, and that was actually her icon also was the original. We need something. <laughs> okay, so how many people, just a show of hands, started on Hype 1.0? All right, wow, that's a good number. I'm, I'm very satisfied, so great to see you all here, <laughs> being along for the last five years. Um, the next one was the 1.5 icon, but I'll say like the 1.5 to 2.0, if this was your first icon, and raise your hand. And then the final one was the 3.0 icon. Um, so yeah, okay, very good turnout. And Michael, who's in the back, also did the, uh, the last two icons. So yeah, amazing graphic designer. Um, so yeah, it's really come a long way um, over the last uh, five plus years. Um, and I think one of the things uh, that I love about Hype is just seeing the great diversity of the talks that we had today, the great diversity of users. Um, so if I was to ask someone here today, like, what do you use Hype for? Some might say it's used for um, chapter start animations in iBooks. Others might say it's a way to make infographics for the newspaper they work for. Um, some might say it's how I build either the shell of the video game or the entire video game itself. Some might say it's used for advertisements. Um, and so I think that's unique. And if someone were to ask me as the developer that has visibility into the audience, um, what, what does the average user look like? There, there's no way I can answer that because the group is very diverse. I've been struggling to figure out who is the main user of Hype, and I still to this day, after so many years, I have no idea because everyone does something different. Um, about the best I could say is maybe a graphic designer, maybe doing some web stuff, but I think that's like very not true of many of you here. So I don't, I don't even think I can say that because some people only use Hype to output videos or only use iBooks or had never done any animation until less than a year ago and now are professional animators. <laughs> Dean. She has a baby yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the bottom line is that it is very difficult to bucket our users. In fact, it is easier to do this type animation than bucketing our users. And just as a small word, so when we did physics, this was a test um, animation that we did to try to figure out what the bounds of performance were for physics. This runs smoothly on like iPhones as far as like iPhone 6, which is amazing, because when we started doing this, it was like, oh, we can get maybe like three frames per second on the iPhone. So to me, that like just that animation is amazing to show how far technology and performance has come, especially in mobile. I think that's pretty important. Um, so I think the question is, what is Hype, at least to me, to the developer? And to me, it's a generic tool to make people more creative, um, form animations and interactions, usually for the web. But for, I think the important thing is the key word is that it's generic. And I hope Hype always stays that way, because I think it's really neat to be able to provide to you an open-ended open creative tool. Um, and just like in general, my philosophy is there's something very special and magical about a blank canvas and opening an app to a blank canvas because that means anything is possible. It can be turned into absolutely anything and everything. Um, some apps have very specific users, so it's easy to focus on those and figure out uh, what choices would improve a very specific set of users. But when we develop Hype, we can't think of just one set of users because often a feature for one user that's really important would be a detriment 
load or complexity to another user. Um, so I, th I think that kind of brought up the question on what direction do we take hype in? And so that's, the talk is the evolution of hype, but I started thinking about this more and I thought maybe it should be uh, something on um, how you can help evolve hype or how hype evolves and why. And I think one of the most important things is um, having a relationship with your tool maker. And so one thing that I'm just really happy about seeing is everyone here because we can actually have a relationship that you have specific creative needs and I can listen to those needs and I have thoughts that can hopefully combine and make a better tool out of it. So as creative people, I think it's really important to have the ability to influence your tools. I wouldn't say a person is as good as the tools they use, but I think often we feel that way. I know for me, I got the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil and I thought, okay, this is gonna be the tool I'm gonna to use to be able to draw more. Like, I'm gonna be able to draw better, like my lines are gonna be more accurate and it's gonna motivate me. And maybe that was an aspirational purchase, um, but I have drawn a little bit more. But I think, you know, that's static, that's hardware. Uh, software can change a lot quicker than hardware tools. Um, if you are a painter, you only have a certain set of brushes, but if, you, if you're in Photoshop, you can influence the brushes however you want. You can change the size, you can change the brush texture. Uh, some tools like Painter can change how wet the virtual paint is. Um, and so I think that's an amazing ability. The tool makers made it that flexible and open-ended to change, but you can still go back and say, Corel, we need these things, or you can say, Tomo, we need these things. And so I think it's important to have a relationship with your tools. And I think as a user and a developer, I think it's really important to have a relationship between each other as well. Um, so I think the relationship that we have is really um, based on understanding one another. I hear from a lot of you, Daniel hears from a lot of you. Um, and so sometimes I think maybe I have the advantage because I hear you guys talk about your work, but you don't always hear about the challenges that we face. So I think it, it would be interesting to kind of describe um, some things about what we at Tumult do and how we build a product. And so that can maybe form some of the ideas and thoughts you have. So when you come to us and suggest things, that we can speak a little bit of a similar language as well. So rather than the evolution of hype be a trip through memory lane, um, I actually had some goals for the talk. Um, I wanted to explain how we develop software um, and your influence on that. Um, also give an understanding of the trade-offs and considerations with hype because there is a lot to the tool and also describe the best way to make feature requests that hopefully um, I'll be able to understand what you need as well. But first I would like to take a trip down memory lane to the beginning of Hype. So let's go back to early 2011. Uh, this was before Hype was publicly available. People still bought point and shoot cameras. I got all my news from Google Reader. Yeah. May it rest in peace. Um, the iPhone was on version 4, and the iPad had just come out, so this was new. Um, and a pretty big deal at the time, the iPad, I was looking back at news stories, the iPad usually was the product of the year for, I guess it was 2010 um, when it initially came out. So the iPad was all the hotness, there was a lot of rage about it. Um, and of course, Flash at the time was huge. Um, and so there was a big controversy of course, about Flash. Um, and it's easy to forget the dominance it had. I think we're really living in a state where Flash has been, for the most part, killed. Um, but back in the time, Flash was very much alive. There were phone makers really raging, waging war with Apple, saying, we're the ones who are going to support Flash. Like, Blackberry said, <laughs> support Flash. Android said they would support Flash. And Adobe said, great, we'll make it work on mobile, and then they didn't really follow through, unfortunately. Um, so we'll say that was Adobe's bad on that one, and you can see where people betting on Flash, where that got them, uh, at least on Blackberry's case. <laughs> Although I think it's maybe that mentality on why they would think Flash would be good for their phones, that probably is what, what killed them, not necessarily betting on Flash itself. Um, but it was everywhere for a reason before mobile, um, because it could accomplish a lot of what web browsers were unable to do, um, mostly playing videos, building games, running a ton of animations. 
Um, and iOS finally did end that reign. Um, I was at Apple at the time. It was very clear Steve Jobs was making the right choices, not on anything religious or ideological, but based on the technological choices of Flash being bad in performance, bad in security, no mobile story, bad in accessibility. Um, but at this time, of course, he even said in his notes about Flash, HTML5 is a good replacement, and that was correct. There was a lot of hype about HTML5, and no pun intended there. If you've read all the articles, it was, can HTML5 live up to the hype? That's um, a big part of where the name came from. Um, but HTML5 was very tedious. I don't know how many people have tried like hand coding animations that maybe you would have done. Okay, so like a fair number. How many of you love doing that? <laughs> yeah, I'm putting my hand down. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was not fun. I originally tried to build like a photo website, and after a few hours playing with trying to do these animations, I said, this is visual, and the coding is not. So there needs to be a tool to do things visually. Um, and so that's where hype was born from. Um, so there was a few products in its lineage that I just wanted to touch on and how that's been influenced to Hype and some of its design. Um, so there was HyperCard, and I just zoomed it up because, yeah, there was only a 32 by 32 icon of it. Sorry, it looks terrible. But, and that's not even the 1.0 icon because that's in color. The original one didn't have color. Um, but there were a few main apps that Hype took a lot of inspiration from. Uh, the first is Keynote. I think Keynote is one of the best apps ever designed. If you've talked to me about Keynote, you've probably heard me say that. I love it because it's both easy to use and extremely powerful. Um, just even arranging objects in the layout was much better than PowerPoint at the time. And you could have things that look good without doing too much work. You were always in 100% control, but it helped guide you along the way. Um, and Keynote was a big deal for a few reasons. One, because I respected how it did layout of elements. I think when you look at tools, a lot of tools are just these canvases where you arrange elements. Most things boil down to a canvas where you arrange elements or email. Those are like the two buckets of tools. Um, and so Keynote was, was one that was really good at layout. Um, and the other point about Keynote and why I wanted to steal as much from it as possible or look to it when we had a question, which way do we go? What does Keynote do? Is because nearly everyone knows how to use Keynote, or at least PowerPoint. And especially in the Apple ecosystem, Keynote was just one of those tools where um, if someone knew how to use Keynote, then they'd go into Hype and they would know how to use Hype, or at least most of Hype. Maybe they'd need to learn keyframe animation interface, but they'd be halfway there already, so there would be less of a learning curve. So motion was the other one uh, that I actually looked at. So I had done some work in After Effects, so I understood motion. I hadn't done a lot of work in motion itself, um, but clearly being from Apple, it had an interesting user interface. And um, there were a lot of great features that I saw in motion that I thought this will work for animations on the web. The first was the record one. So After Effects does not have a record button or a way to automatically do keyframes, or at least it didn't back when I was looking at it. They may have added it since. Um, and so that to me was groundbreaking that I just move items around. I don't have to hit a keyframe for every single property. So I'm going to steal that. Uh, the other one that I stole a little bit later from Motion was the split layout where you select an element, and then you just see the properties for that element. So in Hype 1, and if you used Edge Animate, Edge Animate is, is this way too. And I think it, it's interesting to see the distinction that you basically would have a top level element, you expand the group, and then you get the properties. <coughs> the problem comes from Hype 1, where there was no grouping, to Hype 1.5, where we decided we need to be able to group elements. That seems pretty important for a feature. That then you have the grouping, and then you have the properties, so things don't really mix and match, and you're always expanding and collapsing, things like that. And Motion didn't have quite the same interface, but they had the idea, which is what we stole, that you select an item on the top and you see things on the bottom. And that, to me, I think has worked out really well. Um, so Motion was one. In fact, I think the general thing that if you ask um, me, like, is Hype easy to use, my standard response is, it's a lot like Keynote with Motion's timeline interface. Um, that's a little bit of a lie. I don't think it's quite like Motion's, but if you use those two products, then no problem type. 
And then the final one was HyperCard. And in fact, I did not use HyperCard so much as I used HyperStudio, which was a bit of a knockoff. Um, but I used to do these like which way stories. I think that's maybe a general theme is like loving which way stories. But I would do which way stories in Hyper Studio. And so you would have buttons going to different cards. And so I thought that was a pretty powerful way to do interactivity. Um, very simply, it seemed everyone got it. Everyone reminisced and loved HyperCard, um, as did I. Um, there were also similarities to Keynote slides. So a scene in Hype is very similar to a slide or similar to a card. So we could do that. We could also use the button metaphor um, to trigger those actions as well. So one thing you won't see on here is Flash. So I was never a Flash animator. I did not use Flash. A lot of people come with suggestions on Flash, and then I have to kind of scramble and try to learn how to do things in Flash. Um, I thought there were a lot of things that were easy to do in Flash, so I used some of them I recreated in Hype, and then I realized later you actually need an action script to do them. So some of my ignorance on Flash probably helped out, I don't know. Um, but there were some non-goals of Flash, one of which, um, or non-goals of hype, that Flash did have that I explicitly knew. One was not being able to do game development in version 1.0. I didn't see that as a priority due to the complexity. Um, but I didn't want to limit the app to any specific domain. It was just more of Flash can do so much at that point. What things should we just not focus on for version 1? But later I've learned a little bit more about Flash, especially doing symbols to figure out what users expect. So I've had to dive in a little bit. And I like Flash for hand-drawn animation. <coughs> so this is a video um, of the very first demo of Hype. So this is pre-beta. This is pre-1.0, pre-alpha. Um, I just wanted to show it off because I thought it was funny. Um, it's really old. Let me see if I can. I'll just fast forward a little bit. So it's really primitive at this point. In fact, there's a lot of things that are fake on the interface. So I had the thought when doing this that there would be some notion of scenes. So you can see the tab bar. You don't do scenes as tabs now. Um, you'll notice there's a few things that had never shipped. I had grand ideas of doing searching for the inspector. And that never shipped. There was a while from, I think, until like Hype 2.5, where there was just this bottom space <laughs> the inspector where the search bar was going to be, and then I was like, okay, I'm not going to get to this anytime soon. <laughs> and removed it. The one thing you'll notice with this first version was there was no record button. Um, so I kind of had the thought, like, oh, recording would be neat, but is it really necessary? And then watching Kathy use Hype, it became very clear that just adding keyframes was extremely tedious. Um, so there had to be a better way. So the record button was one of those things. Um, Oh, here's a fun one. You'll notice you do have the macOS font panel, which I know a lot of people miss right now. Um, there's some very good reasons for doing web fonts that we abandoned it, but you actually could set any map font back then. That was the shortcut. Um, but you'll notice it was very similar, like in ideas and timeline execution. Uh, yeah, there was, if you were setting up an animation, it wouldn't show the little dots. I think that helps visualize what an animation actually is. So there it's setting position, playing the animation. So this was kind of like the first version that you could actually kind of sort of do something with. It could do video. And my first demos were showing like reflection and all these other effects. Um, and most people hadn't seen anything like that on the web before because people just hadn't really tried using HTML5. In fact, it shocked me. The very first test I ever did um, with Hype was simply dragging a box around and seeing if the web was fast enough to like, follow a cursor with a box that I didn't even know that it was that fast. Um, so I think the question is, how did we get from this to this of today? And the real answer is a lot of baby steps. Um, Hype has had seven major releases and 20 minor releases over the last five years. Um, so each one is composed of a number of uh, bug fixes and a lot of different features. So it's slowly marching along. I know about half the room actually had been on 1.0, so thank you for sticking with us for that long. Because 1.0, if you try to use it today, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't even group items at all. There was no zooming in or out on the canvas. There, it was 1.0 was missing a lot. 
I think it's fun to explain how, how an idea becomes a feature because all those steps came from somewhere. So I wish I had like a little cute, like how a bill becomes a law, conjunction, junction, or schoolhouse rock animation to share with you. Um, but I just have bulleted slides, so I don't have to do. <laughs> don't want me to do all my time on animations. So the general flow, of course, is ideas are formed. These come from a variety of different sources. Um, we then will prioritize and triage the ideas, figure out how important these are. And that's kind of an ongoing process. An idea may come one time, and that may not be the right prioritization or triage. And so we constantly revise. Um, and then for any release, we kind of establish what are the goals going to be. And I'll go into this in more detail. Um, clearly doing design and engineering. Testing, very specifically beta testing, is what I want to talk about. Um, and then releasing. And I think that's a big part, especially post-mortem, is the idea that became the feature, the right feature for that idea. Um, so it's a whole cycle. So I want to talk about where ideas come from. They come from a variety of different sources. Um, I'm going to take a few tangents. Um, but by volume, most of the ideas come from you, that you will write us um, either by email or on the forums or on Twitter and say, Jonathan or Tumble, Daniel, I need this. And a lot of times we implement that directly as it's asked. Um, sometimes we will look at the feedback and say, OK, that's interesting, but I'm not sure this applies to everyone, so we'll put it on hold. And we'll start to collect more and more feedback and different feedback and figure out what are people really asking for, or get more use cases. And so there's direct feedback, which is just kind of that idea. And then there's kind of a synthesis of what are our users trying to do, and what tool can we give them to accomplish that. If we were to implement every single little idea, um, hype would be extremely bloated. It's like the um, Henry Ford saying, saying, if I had asked people what they wanted, um, they would have said faster horses. And so I think it's up to a tool developer to really consider what's best for all the users. So I really like when you write us with questions, how do I do X? Because that gets our creative juices going, because we're problem solvers. And so if we don't have a good answer, um, then we usually will spend a big portion of our brains thinking, how can this be done? Or if, even if we do have an answer, we could say, here's the 10 steps you need to do. And then we realize, OK, 10 steps is kind of problematic, because anyone wants to do that, they're going to need to learn all 10 steps in logical sequence. And that's, that's a lot to do. And so by this token, like features come from ourselves too, because we have itches to scratch. Um, so I'd like to take a little detour um, on giving good feedback. And I don't want this to be just like, oh, here's how you talk with us. I, I think when you talk with any toolmaker, with anyone whose apps you use, these are probably good ideas. Some will vary with Tumult and the culture we have on support. Some will vary with other companies. But I think these are general rules, and you know, I'll try to elaborate. Um, so the best way that we respond is there is the in-app feedback button, there's email, and there's our forums. All are pretty much treated equally to us. Um, so if you send feedback in app or via email, it all goes into the same support bucket. So this is um, our kind of help desk software. So if you ever write us and get like the re reply back and it's like, oh, right below this line, it's coming from here. Um, sometimes the responses are a little bit ugly, but it helps us all synchronize, um, share the work, and make sure we track everything in customer interaction so we can look back. You could write us with some new problem or a new feature idea and you could look back at previous interactions and try to figure out, OK, why is this person asking for it? Forums, we don't track this way. We actually use forums just like a regular user, but it's all about the same. Um, the one point I'll bring up about email is sometimes you can email us directly. And because everything goes into this bucket, you don't necessarily need to email us directly. Um, Going in that bucket, we'll see it. I pretty much read every single email. I may not respond to every single email, although most, basically everything gets responded to either by me or Daniel or someone. Um, but you, you can email me directly. You don't need to. 
Um, but a lot of other companies, you just get first tier support and never gets on to engineering or escalated. So I would say the asterisk there is that's very company dependent and sometimes you just need to go someone who's actually the engineer or the developer or the tool maker. Um, you might bug them, but your tools will get better that way. Um, so I think the other thing that's really important is I love hearing about use cases. It's one thing to ask for a feature. It's another thing to say, I'm making this children's book and I want my character to animate this way and I can't do it or that, that's what I'm trying to do. Like, and so the use cases really help because when it's just a feature in a vacuum, I don't necessarily understand how it fits into the larger picture. So always like a detailed use case is the most useful thing. And that helps me empathize with what you're trying to do as well. Um, along with that, sending like sample documents and screenshots is great because that just helps communication. I can see more directly what you're doing. Um, and if you happen to like want to be persuasive because we're all human beings, sometimes you need persuasive speech, um, try to explain why others might need it. Um, and if you can do that, then that helps your cause. And also, I, I, again, this like always goes down to personal relationships. People that I know or have known a long time, um, just in general, like I'm, I'm a human being, so I'm going to be receptive to the relationships that I've built, even if they're online relationships where meeting people here for the first time, which I've done, some, some people I've known for a while. So tell me about yourself, tell me about your work, about what's important to you. <laughs> and we do take bribes, usually in the form of chocolate. So I think there are a few things that I wouldn't say like, okay, don't do this. I, every situation is different. I could say don't get upset at people, but honestly, sometimes I respond when someone's unhappy. I'm a human being, I'm going to respond to that. So I'm not gonna say on avoiding bad feedback, don't send an angry note, because honestly, sometimes that works. Um, but I will say tweeting is pretty meh as a feedback mechanism. And the reason why I don't like tweeting for feedback is it's really hard to establish a good dialogue and get details across in a tweet. 140 characters is just not enough. You want to send a direct message, that's fine. Um, but tweeting and saying, how about this feature, then it's really hard for me to follow up and say, why do you need this? And then it's hard for you to follow up and explain why you do. So I think tweeting is just not the best form for feedback in general. I think assuming, and this, this goes for like every tool maker, assuming that we know everything. Um, clearly we're a developer, I am a programmer. By trade, I know certain things about Objective-C, but there's a lot, even in the web technology world, I know nothing about. There's tons of tools and technologies out there, third-party items, servers, um, and saying, how do I support this? Like, we have to do a lot of research. So anything you can do to kind of describe if you think it's an esoteric technology uh, will help. Um, Repeat requests generally don't help that much. So we have a system that kind of catalogs and describes every single request. So asking again and again is, for the most part, actually just kind of wasting <coughs> both of our time. Um, and then the other thing that's really bad is if we ask, if you say something and we say, would you like to join the beta program? It usually means it's coming up in the next release where we have it ready now and we want you to try and give us feedback immediately. And so if you don't join the beta program, then you're losing out an opportunity to help yourself, um, but you're also losing out on that opportunity to, to make sure that your needs are fulfilled. So if, if uh, you're not part of the beta program, and we ask, and, and you're welcome to join, just talk to me afterwards. Um, and definitely come up. And not bribing us with enough moolah um, also is, yeah, that's bad, so. Okay, so I want to bend that detour into good versus bad feedback. <coughs> go back to where do ideas come from. So I talked about user feedback. Um, but I think the other one is other apps and competitors. So I talked about Hype's relationship with Keynote, with Motion, with HyperCard. Um, and so we can look at these to see what we might be missing. In fact, Flash is actually a big app that we look to at this point because it was clear to see Flash did so much. What direction do we need to go to do the types of creative things that people want to do? I'm not saying it's feature for feature, that's what we do, but it's what are the types of things people were doing. Um, and I think one thing people have mentioned is vector graphics. Flash had a lot of that. It's easy to look at Flash and see that might be something we want to do. 
Um, we also look at direct competitors because they have good ideas as well. And so I'm shameless about stealing from direct competitors. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are dead, so we've outlived most of them at this point. Um, but competition is good, helps everyone. Uh, the other thing that all ideas come from is also Apple and Mac OS and the web. So certain things will go in a new version of Mac OS, and we either need to adopt them, otherwise we'll be kicked out of the Mac App Store, or they're good ideas to adopt. Um, one thing is like the versions, where you can go back in time for any hype document. That was something we adopted. Uh, so that was great. And web technologies are really interesting as well. So one of the things about Hype is we want to be on the bleeding edge of whatever is next. Hype was born from the idea of there's this bleeding edge, it's HTML5, it's really hard to do animations. So we can take that HTML5 wave, we can be on the edge, we can bring technologies that are only available to developers. We can bring them to people without programming backgrounds, or even if you have a program, programming background, <coughs> make it much easier to access. So that's what I like doing, and I like exposing those brand new things. And that's, that's an opportunity for us. Um, and then the final, um, or not the final, but one of the other areas is business partners. There are some of you in this room, and, and other people have a vested interest in hype because you actually use it for your business. Um, and sometimes they bribe us um, because they are bigger and have money. Um, so from time to time, we'll do specific features. We may keep them private for a little bit, and then see, okay, once we have enough customers, this could be a public feature. So I'll just give you a sneak peek at one thing that we did for a magazine um, or a newspaper out of France. And this is a plugin structure where you can actually get some new inspector items. Um, they needed legal disclaimers on advertisements. And everything is an ad, so they have a very specific export format. So there is um, a menu hook that lets them package, change things, and save it as a zip file, and then upload to their servers. So that's the type of thing where we work specifically with a partner. It's not in the public one, we don't have it documented, but we hope to get it one day at some point when we know if that's the right feature. And so we can work closely with them, do some changes while it's kind of in private mode. And to round it off, the app itself can also beg for features. Um, sometimes we'll do a feature in one area and then there's this logical progression of, oh, that's what we should do next. So if you take <coughs> symbols, for example, it's really clear we needed to do some way to better encapsulate animations and reduce duplication. And then the next feature that came out of it was persistent symbols, that you kind of want things to be kept alive across different scenes. And so that persistent, we didn't plan persistent symbols, but we knew there was this set of problems. And now that we've got symbols, oh, we can use symbols to solve this problem if we just make these few changes. Um, so it's really fun when the app kind of says, oh, here's your next feature to do. So there's really no end to all the features that we have. Um, our bug tracker has 602 open feature requests right now. Um, so if we were like at a brisk pace and added two features per week, it would still take six years to implement them all. Um, and I don't think people would appreciate if we only did one release every six years. So we need to prioritize and triage bugs um, and decide what's going to go into a release, what's important, what's not important. And so it's easy just to look at upsides and downsides to any particular feature. Clearly, the amount of impact is the most important thing. And not just the number of users affected, but what it does to your creative output. Um, the best thing for me is when I see a hype document, and there's something new, bold, unexpected in it, something that I've never seen before. That's what I like to see. Um, and so that, that's why we do a lot of hype, and so it's, that's an amazing feature. Or how many users will this help? So I think the opportunity on creativity is big. Um, we're a business also, so there are factors that we need to consider. Will this feature get press, or will it not get press, honestly, is a factor in deciding. Um, we need to stay alive. Will this feature make money or will it not make money? Is someone going to make a purchasing decision based on this feature? Um, so there's a lot of considerations kind of on the opportunity front that we as a business, I'm just going to be honest, like we do consider as well. And for prioritizing, we also need to look at the downsides. If we implement this, what are the worst things that could happen? And I think bloat is a terrible thing. Um, 
that could happen to a product where people launch it and don't know where to begin. And I don't want hype to be that way. Um, one thing that we did to try to help with product complexity was the standard professional split. That way people can start with standard and then go into professional when they're ready, when they have these problems and realize there must be a, a solution. Oh, it's in professional. I think people who started on 1.0 were the early days. They got to grow up with the product. But new users don't get to grow up in the same way. We're going to learn about the new features as time goes on. And so doing standard and doing professional is kind of our attempt at a solution to both balance being able to do a lot of different unique features that maybe have fewer um, use cases but are equally important to a smaller number of users and keeping something simple from an introduction standpoint where people aren't overwhelmed. The other downside is code complexity and runtime size. So this is kind of me as a developer talking, um, at least on the code complexity side. side. Any time we add a feature, it gets harder to add a new feature. This is a simple truth in developing an app. So any feature makes it harder to add a new one. Um, programming is a very complicated web, and we as developers try as hard as we can to manage that web and make that not the case, but no matter what, um, new features interact with other parts, and you make one change, and if you break, it's very easy to break something. Code is fragile and complicated. Um, hype itself is probably something like 120,000 lines of code. So that's you know, not a ton to manage, but that's a lot to manage. The other thing I want to touch on is runtime size. So this is one of the main um, issues with adding anything, any features that would have be expressed on the web. So there's features that are in the editor. This is the editing environment. And then there's features that are improving how JavaScript is done. So imagine something like uh, scene transitions that needs to be included in the runtime. Things like Bezier curves or timing functions, that's runtime. Physics, that's runtime. And so any feature we add that is expressed in the output will increase the runtime size. And for a lot of people doing iBooks, it doesn't really matter. Those users will download that. There's not too much consideration. But if it's a web page, if you're on a cellular network, you don't want that to be very large because you want your page to load. You want people to see it. Um, if someone's waiting a long time, then uh, they're going to leave your page. But even worse than that is advertisers who have very strict requirements on the sizes that are allowed. So runtime size is extremely important. Um, I'm actually going to do something <coughs> fun and live, maybe. Let's go to terminal just to show you how much we care about the runtime size. I'm going to go into the terminal. You don't have to, you don't have to be a terminal <coughs> user. Or not. <laughs> All right, that's lovely. OK, so as a programmer, when you program, you do things kind of like little steps, and you do a, a message saying what you changed along the way. So I'm going to say git log, and I'm just going to search for any time I say um, minification. That's me trying to reduce the runtime size. Um, so you can see these, these are all just the notes I make saying what I'm doing. Um, so every byte counts. This one is a saving of five bytes, and I still made that change. This one is saving 20 bytes. I still made that change. So every single byte counts. And you can see how much um, these, these are. And so every byte adds up, and so we care a great deal about the runtime size. Um, and sometimes we get some really big ones. Like in the early days, it was easy to make changes. So this one's 26% improvement going from 51 kilobytes to 38 kilobytes. So the, the early days were a little bit easier. Later days, not so much. It's, it's hard nowadays. Then another downside is timing. A feature just might take a long time to do, and we don't want to hold up the release. Um, so scheduling is important. Um, sometimes someone will come to us with a great feature, but we want to release in two weeks. It needs to be a really big opportunity for us to hold up the release at that point. 
And uh, I'll just bring this up because I find this to be funny, is procrastination feasibility. Sometimes you can just wait a while and then the need for the feature goes away. <laughs> um, sometimes, there was, there was one, I think maybe it's still kind of good, but at the same time, I don't know if it's necessary. So there was a feature we had which was import edge animate files into hype. And over time, that will become less and less important because edge animate is no more, so people aren't really making new files. So just over time, that one's gonna go away. So there are some features where if you might just need to, to wait and then it doesn't become a feature anymore. Um, so the way we, we do things is we actually rank features based on all these different factors. And so to us, the most important priority zero, which is above priority one, is a regression. It was an hype, something was working, and now it's not working anymore. That's a huge deal, and that making that priority zero means we really focus on quality quite a bit. Um, priority one feature is a showstopper. We can't release without this feature, or we can't release with this bug. We yeah, have priority two, which is, this is probably gonna go in, it's expected. P3, of course, is, yeah, that's important. I'd like to do it. P4 is nice to have. So if you start out, okay, this is another factor. If you start out, it would be nice to have. That unfortunately starts putting it in the P4 bucket. I'm not saying that don't overinflate, like, this is a showstopper. I can't, you know, do anything if I don't have a dash border. It's like, really? I think you can get away with it without, you know, a border dash. Um, so don't overinflate when you talk to us. But also if you say nice to have, that's like a very specific programming terminology. So. Um, kind of hardwired to think of that as, okay, that's probably less important. So this is what our bug tracker um, looks like. So these are our cases for um, upcoming 3.6 milestone, but I can show you all of them. These are sorted by priority. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of cases in there. Total, this is bugs, features, crashes. There's 6,688 open things. So this is a little bit on how the sausage is made. Sometimes you'll see release notes, and it's like bug fixes, and you think, okay, one or two bugs were fixed. Um, usually it's a lot more. And it's not that hype is a buggy application. I, I, from all the data and telemetry and, and talk we get, it's relatively speaking not that buggy, but there's a lot to do. So that's, that's a look in, inside the Sausage Factory. Um, it also, I think, goes to the feedback that you give us, that we actually end up cataloging um, all user feedback in our bug system. So once we have everything entered in, um, we'll want to do a release. And so we'll want to do a release every six to 12 months usually. Um, and so we like to establish a theme for the release. And so there's usually these high priority tent poles that we think are, are going to be a good idea. Things like symbols or responsive layout, filter effects and the like. Um, so we tend to have around five of them for a release. Um, and there's other features in like related code that maybe aren't as important. But it's like while we're banging this out, we can actually bang up these other things a lot faster because the general feature area is fresh in our head. Um, and there are some that are time sensitive, uh, whether it's Apple required or certain things being deprecated that we need to do. Um, so that, that's generally how we form a release and giving it a theme just helps us focus and say this is what's in, this is what's out. So when you email us, it could be a great idea, something we want to do in the future, but it might just not be fitting in with the theme for our release, where it might require a lot now, but if we were to do it later, um, we'd be able to spend less time and have a higher quality feature. So sometimes it's just a matter of time. Maybe you have a great idea, we'd love to do it. It's not fitting in with what we want right now, probably in the future. So the real work is engineering. I actually don't want to describe too much of the engineering. Um, sometimes we'll do a design first. Um, so here is a specific design of something we're um, brainstorming. <coughs> And so sometimes there will be like high, high quality mockups, this is a mockup, um, on what it could be that helps us kind of visualize and get an idea on the feel or the user interface. Um, sometimes we'll architect first and just spend time figuring out how the engineering is going to work. Um, sometimes we get pizza and coffee first, so <laughs> it all depends. But it, the engineering work is actually the boring work. Um, the more interesting thing is testing. Like, uh, um, We'll do internal testing, of course, before any release. Uh, but there is a beta test program. And so beta test, I loved the beta test phase because we may spend a lot of time in a cave and don't know what's going to be popular or not popular. 
So we kind of think of beta tests as a mini release. And we'll make docs and video, um, things to help educate beta test users. Because if we don't do that, we could release a feature and no one would find it. Um, so I really like, and it's kind of like a first draft at the official documentation. In fact, we often call our documentation beta documentation because we get to find out there are people being confused by the documents as well. And so we'll get, for the beta group, we'll get email and forum feedback as well. There's like a hidden forum post. We, in fact, beta tested the forums before sending that out to everyone because we used to use a different forum system. And this new forum system is a thousand times better. Um, and at the end of the beta period, we'll also send out surveys. And the surveys are really fascinating and revealing. So we'll ask some questions, like when we did Hype Pro, one of the questions we asked was how many people chose the light interface versus the dark interface. Um, I don't remember what the number was there, but I think that one was a bit surprising, um, given also the default. And we'll ask what features did you use? And some of the features that people use are not the ones we expected. Some of the ones that we spent a lot of time engineering may not be the ones uh, that people ended up using. So it, it's really revealing and helps us, especially when we're doing our actual documentation for the release, figure out what do we need to focus on? What do we need to tell people? What are people actually going to use and be excited about? It? Also in a beta program, there's a few times we've just removed a feature. Um, so I'll, I'll list two of those features. One was iCloud support. So right now you can, in the save dialogue, you can say save to your iCloud folder and that's fine. Um, but in the early days, Apple didn't give you that dialogue in the save panel. You kind of had to like opt into it and do a lot of work. Um, and what we found was that um, one, it was kind of flaky, uh, uncertain if documents were even going to save correctly. And two, by doing it, um, you would get the save panel and it would always open up to the iCloud section, which was like some extra separate section. It's a little bit different now. And that was even the case for exporting. And if like exporting to an iCloud folder is completely useless and there was no way to get around that. So we just were worried about the risk of the feature being to that completely. Um, and now you can save to your iCloud folder because I guess we half procrastinated on it. That was a problem that also kind of went away that Apple decided to enable saving um, if you so choose. The other one that went away and then made a comeback was being able to scale um, using like the um, CSS transform zoom that was in some of the betas. And then we found a bunch of problems with it and realized it wasn't ready for prime time. And we wanted to ship 3.0, so we shipped 3.0 without it, and then added it back. There was a hidden default, a couple of you I may have shared it with, that you could enable it, but I'd always be like, and there's all these issues, so be careful. Um, so sometimes we'll remove features, but that's pretty rare. And the final thing is thrusting it upon the world, so the feature goes out. Um, hopefully it gets a lot of press, hopefully a lot of users like it. Uh, but we do need to determine, was this successful? Because we want to improve our processes. So we'll do a, a post-mortem. We'll look at the direct feedback on the features. That to us is very useful. Um, some features that are really good and popular, we hear nothing about. And it's not that people aren't using it. They are using it. There's just nothing wrong with it. So we, we don't hear anything. And it's kind of funny that way. Um, but what we will do is see support documents that maybe are using a feature. So it's, the support document is probably unrelated to the feature, but then we'll see, oh, people are in fact using this. Um, so that helps us determine feature usage. And then also if there's any engineering concerns, it's kind of like the last step. Are there crashes from this feature? Did it end up adding code complexity where we didn't think it would? And what to do about that? So that's kind of the full loop and full cycle. <coughs> So I'd like to go through just like an example on kind of the end to end of how hype actually legitimately evolves. Um, so it starts out with someone writing us an email. This is the in-app feedback. Uh, you can get to it either from the hype menu or from the help menu. And so in this case, it's someone asking that they would like scene swiping like a page. Um, a Walter Disney is saying, I'm working on a children's book that's composed of a lot of different scenes. I currently use the on swipe left right with push transitions for scene changes, but the effect isn't quite what I'm going for. Right now it's a swipe gesture and then a scene change. I'd like it to be more like a page turn in iBooks, the page should move along with the finger. 
talks about using it with his daughter and how she didn't quite get it. Um, so sends along the hype document and a reply to email address. So that's a lot of good information for us to understand the request. Um, so we'll get this. This is our um, support software. So we, we get the email. And then it gets logged in our bug tracker. So one thing that you'll notice in the bug tracker, I don't know if I can get my mouse over there anymore, is that there's that URL kind of in the middle field. And that's a link back to the support case. So every time we get um, a question about a feature, we log that in so we can link back to the original support case. And so someone will reply saying, you know, thanks for the request, I can see how it's needed, or might ask questions if there's more clarification. I've added it to our to-do list, let me know if there's anything else you'd like to see. So that feature maybe wasn't that high of a priority, but over time we get a bunch of different requests. So you can see in this more filled out case, there's a lot of different links that we've done. We originally added those links because our grand idea was whenever someone made a request, when we implemented the feature, we wanted to email back and say, hey, you know, we did this feature, check it out, let us know what you think. Um, but we get so many requests and there's no automated way to do that right now that we don't actually have that built in. I still would love to do that and kind of complete the loop, especially if it's like a trial user that said, oh, you know, I won't buy hype until there's this, then we could be like, there's this, I'll you know, buy hype now. Um, but we do actually keep track of, of every time, whether it's from email or the in-app feedback, or you can see at the bottom there's a forum post um, about that. And this is a little bit contrived, but um, we, we keep track of all of that. And so the more we see, the more of a priority that becomes. So over time, this became a priority. and said, OK, we're getting a lot of requests. We need to do that in the next version. So did a little bit of a mock-up, some code changes, and then from that, there is the completed feature. Um, so, hey, on drag, you can you know, now choose different scenes. You, of course, need to choose one in the past and one in the future, which can be different depending on where you're at. And so now you can drag, still have the animation running on the, the original scene. And so that's what the feature looks like. And that's kind of the general example of usually what happens. That was pretty direct feedback. Sometimes it's even more direct than that, that there will be a forum post. This is a legitimate, that feature is a real feature, came from real users, but the, the flow is a little contrived. This is um, legitimately what happened, is um, there was a post talking about using symbols, and then Hans said, oh, hi, you're kind of missing this thing. And I looked at it, I looked at the code, I'm like, oh, we are kind of missing that thing. So I made some changes, got back, and you know, a, a couple days later, it's in the next release. So that happens too. And that, that's always fun for us as like creators that we can that quickly um, satisfy our requests. So, you know, that's, I think, kind of the flow and the end. I hope that was interesting. That's our perspective. I mean, I hope you got that a lot of different decisions go into choosing what features to build and when and, and why. And, I think you all request things and kind of want it immediately. And I would love to do everything immediately, but there's just not all the time. But we try to look at everything and, and try to figure out what's best for most people. Um, and we do that through building relationships. And so it, even if we already have a great relationship, I think this can transfer to other tools that you use. Um, and so the, the point is to really just make the best tools together. And I think having that philosophy that we're all in this together. A tool maker is nothing without a tool user, and a tool user is nothing without, well, the tool. Um, that's, that's the philosophy that I like, and I hope that you take that with other tools in life. Thank you. So I'll open it up to a little Q&A. You can ask me anything. I hear. Have you removed features? Yes, it's rare, but we've removed a few. So um, from time to time, there will be features that we find are either confusing to users or legitimate reasons to remove something or other. Um, let me see uh, if I can go and type. So I would say I'm like pretty pleased that there's very little that we legitimately removed. Remove. We've changed a few keyboard shortcuts from time to time to be in line with Pro features. Um, 
let me think. There was in the scene inspector, there was one feature that was horribly terrible. It was on animation complete. And you had a callback for any time um, any timeline was finished, you would get this handler. So people would start out with the main timeline it would work because they would use it for looping or something like that. And then they would add another timeline and then it would get called at this random time and they didn't know why it was happening. Um, and so we ended up fake kind of removing that feature where any new documents don't have it. Any old documents that used it will still show it. So that was one thing. Um, Dropbox support is another one where Dropbox has basically said, hey, we're you know, canceling doing this public folder. And so that's kind of forcing our hand to remove the feature. Um, I think there's any other high profile ones we've removed. A lot of our changes, like timelines used to be relative by default and they became non-relative. Um, relative timelines is actually another one that was, uh, <laughs> the idea came from something that Kathy was doing with timelines and you didn't show it in your example, but basically trying to do a map and get things going back. So relative timelines was the idea there, but relative timelines we downplayed because it was the, this will solve this problem, and then we realized it was actually very confusing. Um, so yeah, so that, that one was a little bit, that was a half fail. It works really well when you know how to use it, and it's just so hard to wrap your mind around. So that was one feature. There was a lot of features I guess we, we've downplayed over time that they haven't worked out too well. Um, there are some features that just got superseded. Like in the view menu, there is um, a specific way to set up guides and like rows and columns, and then we just went to a grid system, so it kind of, kind of went away. So we'll remove them every once in a while, but I would say we have a good record for not changing the app too much. Um, one thing I had mentioned was Jake's Linda course is on hype. That's 2.0, right? And I think everything in that course is still valid this day, even though the user interface has changed a little bit, pretty much everything is there. So if you get beyond the fact that it's a one window interface, um, it's still a great course. And I think there's a lot of value in not changing up the app and not forcing people to relearn. So a lot of that comes from designing it right the first time. That's hard. Yeah, yeah. you got the mic, Dale. Yeah, hey. Um, I was wondering if there is an API, if the user community wanted to extend it by writing plugins, if that's possible? So um, there's three things I'll mention. Um, one, from a JavaScript perspective, there's actually a group on the forums who are doing these JavaScript extensions um, that are looking to hype. So that's just like a great way. That's not even like a plugin extension. That's just include this JavaScript file. You get extra functionality. They're doing really neat things. Um, so what you saw with the business partner video is a plugin API. So those are Objective-C plugins. And that really is mostly for export and then a, little, a few other hooks that you have. Um, there are some danger in doing a plugin API. I think Sketch is one of the latest poster titles, but there's a history of everyone who basically exposes the entire app to plugin makers. And then they internally changed the app, and the plugins were relying on specific things that got changed, and then you launch the app, and the app crashes. And so we don't have a plugin API, but I'm always interested in what you're trying to do. And so sometimes there are things that we can expose, or I would like to expose. I think as hype becomes more mature, and I have a better idea on what people are doing, and hype is probably going to change less and less in some of its core functionality, then that becomes the, OK, now we can start looking at doing extensions. So that's something I'm interested in, and I think Again, part of hype is not limiting creativity. So, you know, if it's possible, I want it to be possible with hype. Uh, so, I think the answer is, yeah, I want to hear what you want to do. Maybe it doesn't need a plugin. Maybe a plugin is the right way to solve it, and then that might be possible. And and there are some books right now. Um, so, if you're interested in the export end of it, we can talk. Um, is there a question in? The direction that hype is moving towards. Uh, do you ever see it becoming like a platform where you collaborate um, with different members of a team? Like, for example, somebody well versed in JavaScript can combine and just collaborate with an experienced animator and just kind of share the same project and create, you know, cool interfaces or just good projects. Yeah. So I think that there is kind of two things. There's one collaboration between different people, and then there's like the notion of collaboration on the single document. 
Um, so the single document case is a tough one because the way, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but real-time collaboration is usually not what you want. Very rarely are two people actually in remote locations kind of working on the same thing. It might be your video conference, and you have some second channel, it's really just like the side-by-side. -side. That's pretty rare. If two people really need to work on something, especially when they're not in the same location, they're gonna be on different time zones. They're gonna be working on different things. And a lot of flows just aren't good for that. I'd love to be able to have some visual way to diff and merge documents together. That's our provide. Um, as far as improving the workflow between designer and developer, that's always something I'm interested in. Um, so if there's specific thoughts you've had or problems you've had, I'd love to hear more about those workflows. Um, I'd say it's nothing on the immediate horizon, but it's a problem in the back of my head that's kind of, the wheels are always turning and I'm looking, is there anything new or interesting that can be done in that space with Hype? Because yeah, we don't work in a vacuum. There's a lot of individuals and freelancers here, but there's a lot of people who need to work on teams, especially as Hype becomes more popular, graphic departments are using it. Um, and there's a lot of workflow going between different people. I have a question for you, uh, I get you. Jonathan, how do you look at um, AR and VR? Um, is that you know, what, how do you, from your perspective, look at those technologies? And is that anything you'd ever dream about in a hype or is that a separate program? Or is that too big of a question? Or how do you look at that? No, I don't think that's too big of a question. I think, you know, I love doing creative tools. So I think it's easy to look at, especially VR, and say, what kind of tooling does virtual reality need? Um, especially when it comes to, because again, that's a very visual medium. Um, it's a very interesting technology. So I don't think hype, is, hype the app is necessarily related, but I think Tumult, the company, has an interest on what kind of tooling might there need to be for virtual reality. In the same vein that Hype is tooling for HTML5, what kind of tooling do you need for VR? <coughs> AR, I'm not as bullish on it personally. I have my reasons, but um, I, I think VR, like if anyone's tried the headset, I think it's fantastic. It's like being on a holodeck. I love it. So um, <laughs> it, It's hard to see that not becoming something People need their tools. When uh, when making feature requests, is it easier or more effective to submit several different features in one request or have multiple requests if they are unrelated? So I'm glad you asked that because I almost put that in my slides. So I do not want the format to be an impediment to anyone submitting a feature request. And that's why I didn't include it in my slides. But pragmatically speaking, one um, note per request is just a little bit easier because then we can have a thread on that request. Our support system is like kind of set up more for, it's hard to do in line, then things can get messy. So one thread per request or one email per request is usually easier. It's easier for us to reference and chat about. Um, but in all honesty, get us your requests. Um, I, I don't want the, oh, this is gonna be a lot of work because I have to do you know five different emails or 10 different emails. And sometimes like requests are related, there's a natural flow to how you're requesting it. It might be, I want these three features on symbols and the discussion, the third one is a little bit dependent on what you were doing in the second request. Um, so yeah, individual is a little bit better, but we sort it all out on our end. Um, so I don't mind doing a little bit of work if it means we get that request and we get that feedback. Uh, realizing this involves proprietary information, any hints or teases you can give us about upcoming features on the horizon that excite you? Uh, well, if you were paying attention, there were a couple, there were a couple hints I did drop. Um, so I think vectors are pretty exciting. Uh, I, the, you know, there is, again, there's like this procrastination feature, especially with web technologies, where a web technology may be available in one browser, or there might be a few competing technologies, and sometimes, as much as hype likes to be on the bleeding edge, sometimes we need to wait out who's going to win. And so I think things like doing shapes and vector graphics, my mentality early on was Canvas would be better than SVG, and I've taken a complete 180 on that, and now it's clear SVG is one um, that more Canvas isn't really being developed. As people know, understand SVG, there's a lot of other tools, like Sketch, that can output. SVGs as well, um, so SVG seems to be the way forward. So sometimes there's features that's like very clear, like everyone's asking for it, and sometimes we wait it out. 
I see. I think that's you know that's one that might happen. Okay, we have time for two more questions. I know, yeah, I think you're asking for one. And they'll like it. Um, I've been working with Hype for a while now. I left Adobe AJ and I started with one and then left and then came back. Um, and uh, the thing that's been the most frustrating and almost made me leave you guys from sheer, like, just screaming at my computer is that it doesn't mask from right to left. I have to use that all the time. I know I understand the, the technology is that the CSS is left and top, but is there any chance of getting that or is there production for it or? Yeah, I started the forum on it, and there's like 7,000 people behind me. <laughs> so, so we do actually look at um, some of the things that we started doing now that our forums have become more popular and people actually reply to each other. We do look at forum posts and kind of, there's a very easy way to see the number of views on a forum post or the number of replies, and so that helps a lot. Um, I can't make any promises because that has not been implemented yet, but I do understand that's like a big source of pain. Especially when you, if you type the script and you tilt it, it totally goes down. Yeah. Yeah, so I have to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's you know, a few features. Like when we did version 1.0, it was very clear there were some missing features. And we did 1.5, and some of those missing features went down. We've, I feel like Hype has become a pretty mature tool, but there's still a few things where it's like, yeah, Hype should really have that. And yeah, sometimes I just like hold my head in shame that Hype doesn't have that. So. And I know I've said things about repeat requests, but I think a repeat request and a different, like, in-person repeat request is like the, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I, I feel pain, so. Um, in, in one of your slides, you were talking about when a new feature, let's say in CSS3, comes out, that you'll want to take advantage of that. And what I'm wondering is if your runtime, is it sophisticated enough that, um, let's say if somebody's looking at a hype animation in an older browser, is that feature still gonna work or is it gonna be dependent on CSS3 which may not work in that previous browser? So there's a few different levels to that answer. Um, so if it's, where is my mouse? Okay, so let's take a look. Um, I will make a rectangle. So CSS filter effects are one of those features where not only do not all browsers support the standard filter effects, but Apple in iOS 9, I think, um, and, and the latest version of OS 10, um, maybe it was 8, um, added something called backdrop filters. Um, so a backdrop filter, which I'll do another rectangle, I think it's 9, do a backdrop filter. So a backdrop filter looks like this, so you can kind of like in this case, I'm blurring the background contents. So something like that, there's really simply no way to do this on any browser whatsoever. Um, so in a case where there's no possible potential fallback we could possibly do, um, then what we do is we throw up a warning. And we basically list all the browsers where this won't work. And so in this case, we say CSS3 backdrop filters are unsupported and can't be applied. And it lists every single browser, uh, which ones it warrants for is configurable in the document inspector. And at export time, we will basically give a summary of these are all the things that you can't do. So it's important to pay attention to that as you're working with type. There's a lot of cases where the feature is not specifically a CSS3 feature, but for something a browser like Internet Explorer 6, um, it supported a lot of things, but through a different mechanism, through this thing called, is ultimately like a filter effect. And you could um, do all kinds of matrix transformations. You could actually apply blurs. So um, the blurring effect, I believe we have that in IE6, that if you do a foreground blur, um, or maybe that, maybe we didn't do that. But there's like a few um, features where it's like IE didn't support the CSS version, but it did support its own weird version. And so our runtime will implement the IE version. Um, so in some cases we do it that way. Um, I would love to be able to say in some cases do this fallback, but there's very few features where it's like the fallback. Like what would you fall back to? Like if you can't do you know a specific filter effect, are you going to put an image there and then you're doing a lot of work and 
maybe you just want the image anyway, so why are you doing it in CSS when an image might actually be lighter weight and computationally less expensive? Where it's like, I think maybe shadows are okay. There's a few features like reflections. Like, if you don't have reflections, it's not the end of the world. We'll warn you about it, but there's no, to, to us it just seems like maybe there's not like any conceivable fallback or fallback UI that would make sense in that case. Okay. So we, we basically try our best to work and be compatible. Um, and sometimes we need certain restrictions, like sometimes there is a specific browser version of Chrome where they break something, and so we'll put in our runtime ways around that or fixes around that, um, and then later versions of Chrome, we put that feature back in, for example. 